Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining. Uh, we do these seminars and presentations. We try to do these on a monthly basis and have different topics. Um, tonight's topic is um, a legislative update for different things that have come out either at the federal level or at the state level. Um, and we try to do it at the end of the year. So we're capturing as much as possible that occurred in 2021. Uh, in theory, it is still possible that uh, later this month, we may st still get bills that pass. Um, sometimes that happens to end in a rush, um, but uh, so far uh, tonight's episode or tonight's presentation is gonna be based upon um, what, we, what we know to date. Um, what I will ask is if you haven't muted yourself, um, if you can mute yourself, I'd appreciate it. Just during the uh, portion that I'm presenting on, uh, I will give everybody at the end the opportunity to ask questions. And um, as I indicated a few minutes ago, if you have questions in the midst of it and, and you just cannot wait and it is, it is super duper important and you just got to ask it, um, you know, you can unmute yourself and ask or raise your hand and I'll try and recognize you. But if you're muted, that at least um, allows me to talk without, I guess, without, without feedback. Um, all right, so let's get going. It's 2021 legislative update. Um, there are basically uh, three things that I'm going to be covering. Um, first, there are a couple different federal initiatives that are worth noting. I'm gonna to touch upon different um, responses to the uh, Champlain South Tower collapse uh, that took place in Florida over the summer. I'm also gonna to touch on uh, some uh, new regulation F or amended regulation F, which is, uh, was adopted and went into effect at the end of last month that interprets uh, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. So it's something that as um, some things to generally be aware of. What is kind of interesting actually is that from the state legislature's perspective, uh, the state, at least in our view, um, did not pass any community associate, association oriented bills uh, into law in 2021. There have been a number that were proposed. There are a number that are out there that are pending, but as of uh, really mid-December, um, nothing has yet been passed. Uh, there are a couple things that we did want to comment on, uh, bills that, have, that are pending uh, and look like they either have traction or um, they may come to pass uh, at the beginning of either uh, next year or possibly still this month, but uh, most likely next year. Um, and those three bills that are pending that have been introduced and which could impact community associations deal with short-term rentals. Um, and there's also an initiative uh, throughout the state with many different interested parties uh, called the Michigan Housing Coalition that I wanted to touch on and mention so everybody knew what it was and what its objectives were. And then uh, there was a uh, bill that was introduced at the beginning of the year um, dealing with the prohibition of certain restrictive covenants and kind of explain that and how it may um, uh, bear on community associations. And then, and then the last category would be there are a number of uh, areas uh, legally which are of interest to community associations where there are bills that either are looking for sponsors or expect to be introduced uh, in the short term. And those relate to the imposition of fines, liens, and what are considered assessments under the Michigan Condominium Act, uh, amendments to the Marketable Record Title Act, which you may already be in tune to. And then uh, largely in response to the Champlain South power collapse, uh, we do expect uh, throughout the different states, including in Michigan, we do expect a statutory response to uh, new and different requirements for both reserve studies and building inspections and potentially with respect to reserve amounts. So those are the different topics that I intend to cover tonight. Uh, so first up, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which is FNMA and FHLMC uh, lender requirements. So why are these on here and what's going on with Freddie Mac and um, Fannie Mae lender requirements? So to understand this, uh, you first need to know, I'm going to use the um, terminology of warrantable and non-warrantable condominiums, and you may wonder what I mean by that. Uh, a warrantable condominium, when I use that term, what I'm talking about is a condominium where a home buyer can finance the purchase of a unit within that condominium using what we call a conventional mortgage 
that's underwritten by one of the governmental entities, either Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. And uh, Fannie Mae is the FNMA and Freddie Mac is FHLMC. Those are the two quasi-governmental entities that underwrite and um, basically subsidize a lot of the mortgage industry throughout the US. Um, they set certain underwriting guidelines that if the loans are met, uh, those entities will then purchase loans from um, private mortgage uh, companies, which allows those private mortgage companies to engage in repeat business and, and repeat sales. Um, so if it's a warrantable condominium, then you have a, a, a one of the benefits of being a, a warrantable condominium is that it's easier access to funds because you have access to um, the underwriting that applies to conventional mortgage mortgages provided by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. You tend to have lower interest rates because you're using a uh, conventional mortgage. And um, the use of a conventional mortgage, really the purpose for it is it implements what's a, uh, a nationwide public policy uh, trying to make housing affordable and accessible. Um, there is a secondary component that's coming out that we'll, we'll talk about, which is trying to ensure that housing is safe for those that are purchasing, which is really what's going on here. But so warrantable condominium, that means that you've got a conventional mortgage that's eligible for conventional mortgage financing through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. What do I mean by a non-warrantable condominium? A non-warrantable condominium is a condominium where neither Freddie Mac nor Fannie Mae uh, will agree to buy back that loan. That's a, a condominium whose condition, for whatever reason, does not meet the Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac underwriting guidelines. And what that means is that uh, you can still obtain financing, but the mortgage financing that you're going to obtain will not be underwritten by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, which means you're going to have, uh, from the seller standpoint, if you're within a community that has, is a non-warrantable condominium, you're gonna tend to have more difficulty in locating qualified buyers because you know, buyers won't be able to use um, the ordinary conventional mortgage financing. Uh, those buyers will tend to have a higher interest rate and the result of that higher interest rate is that at least there might be a tendency to potentially depress home values due to a, a, a smaller market of qualified individuals. So as you can probably see, having a warrantable condominium is advantageous to keeping home values up because you'll be able to have uh, a greater market um, of interest in buyers because you'll have easier access to uh, the funds needed to be able to buy it. Um, one thing I, I wanna point out is on this particular slide, I tacked on uh, and wanted to addendum to Fannie Mae Form 1076 and Form uh, Freddie Mac Form 476. Uh, these are the forms that are to be completed that lenders often ask homeowner associations to complete. If there's property managers on the call, you may have given these to complete, but these are condominium project questionnaires that are then used by lenders to determine whether or not a condominium is warrantable or non-warrantable. Um, and the main reason this is on here is as a result of the um, uh, Champlain South Tower collapse over the summer, there's an addendum to that that's been added that deals with certain issues. Um, and this comes out of the Fannie Mae letter uh, dated October 13th, 2021. And then uh, actually just yesterday, Freddie Mac issued Bulletin 2021-38, which is its equivalent of the Fannie Mae letter. Um, both of these set out basically new policies by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac on reviewing the condominium buildings and co-op projects for purposes of determining whether they're warrantable or non-warrantable. Um, and all of the issues that are contained in here, most of the issues that are contained uh, in either the lender letter or in Freddie Mac's bulletin arise out of the South Tower collapse in Surfside, uh, Florida. Um, if you don't know about it, this is a uh, condominium uh, collapse that occurred over the summer where it was a multi-story building, a significant portion of which uh, collapsed um, due to uh, several reasons. Um, that's probably going to be a big part of litigation, but basically the consensus appears to be that um, the owners within the condominium could not agree on certain deferred maintenance and uh, that lack of maintenance along with issues on adjacent property um, caused a deterioration in a support column beneath the pool, which collapsed in which through a progressive collapse caused the building to collapse, causing um, roughly 50 deaths. So out of that incident, the uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have looked at how do they qualify loans? 
And basically what they come back with is an overarching concept that says um, for economy and co-op projects, they're going to have new temporary requirements. They're temporary, but they're in effect until further notice, which means there's no specific end date. It's possible these may go on. Um, but basically what they mean is that condominium projects that have either significant deferred maintenance, have, have failed a, um, in, uh, required inspections, or need repairs due to unsafe conditions are not eligible for purchase. So Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac are going to be looking at the condition of the, of the condominiums and are going to be asking uh, HOA boards to make statements regarding the condition of the um, condominiums and using that to guide whether or not it's going to be eligible for uh, financing. From Freddie Mac's standpoint, it's very similar. Um, they just used the terminology that indicated that if um, condominium or cooperative projects are in need of critical repairs, as that term is defined by Freddie Mac, they are not eligible for sale um, to Freddie Mac. So what does that mean to a certain extent? At least with respect to Fannie Mae, um, significant deferred maintenance includes deficiencies that mean one of or more of a certain criteria. Uh, full or partial evacuation is needed for seven days or more or an unknown period of time, or the project has a deficiencies, defects, damage, or deferred maintenance that is severe enough to affect the safety, soundness, structural integrity, or habitability of the condominium. In essence, you can see a trend in these. These lenders are looking for representations to figure out whether or not the buildings need repair or in significant need of repair or not. And they are most likely not going to underwrite uh, loans and mortgages to buildings that are in need of repair. Um, it's going to be a significant issue going forward as they evaluate the condition of the buildings. In addition to evaluating the condition of buildings and trying to figure out whether uh, the mortgages that they're underwriting and agreeing to take on are in, in buildings that are in good repair, they're also going to be looking at the special assessments. How are special assessments used? And the main reason behind this is special assessments and in Michigan additional assessments are often used for repair and maintenance. And so they're trying to figure out, okay, as we look at these, are special assessments properly repaired? Or, or excuse me, are they properly imposed? And are they being used to uh, properly make repairs? So lenders are going to be expected to come back to HOAs, um, probably more so in the future than they have in the past. And they're going to be asking HOAs for the financial documents necessary to confirm one, that the association has the ability to fund repairs and that any uh, current or planned assessments were properly done, including trying to figure out the reason for the special assessment and uh, repayment terms. This, this requirement, this aspect of the uh, analysis by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac is really a part of trying to look at the financial side of the repairs. You know, the first part of it is trying to figure out is a building insignificant? Is it in need of significant repair? And the second part of it is, all right, kind of setting that portion of it aside, do they have the finances that are necessary to maintain the building? And so they're looking at the financial health of the building also. In addition to that, they're also going, uh, Fannie Mae has changed their um, reserve requirements. Um, this is less of an issue for the state of Michigan because in Michigan, there's already a 10% funding requirement for reserves. But what Fannie Mae used to allow is they used to say, look, we're going to, we're going to require that you have a 10% funding requirement, but if you have a reserve study, then we're not going to obligate you to the 10% reserve funding requirement. In Michigan, we must keep a 10% uh, reserve funding requirement, so it's not that big of an issue. But Fannie Mae is saying now they're going to continue to maintain the concept that reserve studies uh, should be done as a best practice. They're not going to require them. Um, they are saying, though, that regardless of whether or not you've had a reserve study, um, they're going to require that at least 10% um, is, going to be is going to be allocated as a minimum to reserves. And if that's not maintained in reserves, then those uh, will not be, those will be non-warrantable condominiums. So uh, these issues, and, and Freddie Mac has something similar, but these issues from the lender perspective, um, you should expect to see a little more um, of an inquiry, a little more stringent inquiry as lenders flesh this out and go into figuring out how to satisfy these requirements. Um, Fannie Mae's requirements go into effect 
in the first of the year, January 1st, 2022, and Freddie Mac's requirements go into effect at the end of February. So while these are not per se legislative, in the sense that they are not a, um, they are not a new statute that has come out, uh, they are going to, it does relate to the uh, regulatory framework within which um, those particular uh, companies operate, those little quasi-governmental uh, companies operate. So keep in tune to those and you may see those coming up down the line. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about also at the federal level is Regulation F. Uh, Regulation F existed. Um, there have been a couple amendments to Regulation F. Regulation F is the uh, regulatory framework that uh, interprets and implements the uh, Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. It's in, um, in November of 2020 and in January of 2021, uh, the CFPB, the Consumer Financial uh, Protection Bureau, came out with a series of um, requirements or a series of interpretations that went into effect at the, maybe it was a couple of weeks ago, November 30 of 2021, that deal with the interpretation of the FTCPA that are worth pointing out, uh, mostly at a high level. Um, so the, C the Regulation F that went into effect, the amended Regulation F that went into effect at the end of November of 2021 is considered a comprehensive uh, series of debt collection uh, regulations that interpret the FTCPA. Uh, these apply to debt collectors as defined by the FTCPA. And the part that we're talking about were done in two parts. So you had um, one part that was adopted in November 30th of 2020 and another adopted on January 19th of 2021. Um, and they, they, they basically deal with two elements. The first element deals with communications with debtors. Initially, what regulation F or, or what regulation is attempting to do is it's trying to provide guidance to debt collectors and to debtors as to what would be appropriate communication and what would be considered harassment. Um, the second thing that the second category of issues that they're addressing are uh, what would be an appropriate validation notice. A validation notice is basically information sent by the debt collector to the debtor regarding uh, aspects of um, how to contest the debt, the, the basis of the debt, information about the uh, creditor. Um, and there was an open question as to what, although the elements of what needed to be included were there, what the CFPB did was they adopted a form that if it's used can qualify for a safe harbor. And what I mean by that is the use of the form as promulgated by the CFPB would amount to compliance with the FTCPA on the information that needed, needed, is needed to be contained in that validation notice. Um, and on the communications with debtors issues, it's relatively similar. Um, what, the FT, what the CFPB did was they said, here are different things that as long as you comply with these things here, as long as you comply with these terms on uh, communicating with debtors, then we are, we are, you are going to fall within the safe harbor and that will, there will be a presumption that that type of communication will not be considered harassment. Just as a couple examples of things that they intended to cover is um, uh, contacting debtors by email and text messages. Uh, the number of contacts that can be made with a consumer. And then there's also a um, waiting period. After initially speaking to a debtor, a, a debt collector is supposed to wait for a week uh, before contacting a consumer about that same debt. It's not prohibited necessarily, but if you communicate within that week, then you're not going to be able to benefit from the safe harbor that's contained um, within that regulation F. So those are the two aspects. In essence, what the CFPB was trying to do is to say, we would like to provide guidance to debt collectors as to um, the allowable safe harbor terms under which you can communicate with debtors, and then also the contents of a validation notice. Um, this is uh, what you see on your screen now. On the left is what the validation notice looks like as it is promulgated uh, by the CFPB. Um, as you can tell, it, is, it, it contains generic information in, in the sense that it's not based on anybody in particular, but what they tried to do was contain and provide a form that contained the necessary information. And the information that's going to be contained 
in that form basically falls in five categories. And these five categories aren't necessarily new. It's just how they look on that form. That is the format that's been, that's been adopted by uh, the CFPB. And the five categories that are to be contained in it, um, that certain debt collection and communication disclosures, uh, the debt, debt related information about the debt itself and itemization uh, of the debt, itemization related information regarding the debt, information about consumer protections available to the debtor, for example, information about the CFPB, and then also information for the consumer on how to respond, consumer response information. You can see on this particular form, there is a tear off at the bottom. There's literally scissors that describe that. So that's just the form, that's the uh, means by which the form that uh, CFPB offered to use in its validation notice. So this is the model form. Uh, this is, went into effect at the end of November. Um, again, it, this is not necessarily a new statute. The FTCPA has been around for a while, but this is a uh, new regulatory framework that should be reviewed um, especially if you are engaged in uh, debt collection. All right, so those are the federal updates I wanted to go over. Um, the new approach by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac arising out of the uh, Champlain Tower, South Tower collapse, and then the a new regulatory approach for the, um, for the FTCPA. As I indicated, there isn't necessarily new uh, law that's been adopted in Michigan but there are several issues that are coming out and that seem like they're coming down the pike. Um, one of the most talked about and that comes up in, in numerous forms deals with short-term rentals. The, the bill that appears to be most likely to pass dealing with short-term rentals is HB 4722. Uh, this was introduced in May of 2021. It passed the House in October, has not yet been adopted, passed by the Senate, has not yet been signed into law. But amongst the number of short-term rental bills that are out there, uh, this appears to be the one that has garnered the most support. Um, if you are a municipality, if you represent municipalities, uh, municipalities do not like this bill. Um, the main reason that municipalities do not like this bill is it interjects the state into the concept of zoning and is um, stepping into an area to tell municipalities what they can and cannot zone. The significance of it being that they're changing the Zoning Enabling Act by adopting new section 206B that would mandate for municipalities that for the purpose of zoning, the rental of a dwelling, including a short-term rental, is considered a residential use of property permitted in all rent residential zoning districts and would not be a commercial use of the property. Further, a, a local unit of government would be prohibited from adopting zoning ordinance provisions which prohibit short-term rentals. At the moment, at least, based on the drafts that have been circulated and that we've seen, um, HB 4722 should have no direct impact on community associations that regulate uh, rentals, whether they regulate short-term rentals or long-term rentals. Um, the documents that are used by community associations are contractual in nature and are not grounded in the concept of zoning. And so this law, if it, or this bill, if it is adopted, should not have a negative impact on community associations. I say should because um, the one thing that I don't, I'm not a huge fan about, and the thing I, I, I don't especially like is it is starting to take an approach that mandates that short-term rentals be considered residential use and, and not a commercial use. Uh, the significance of that is the residential use requirement and a commercial use prohibition are often found in association documents that lack a rental provision. And they are sometimes used by community associations to try to restrict rentals, even in the absence of a rental restriction. So while those community associations that do not, that do have, excuse me, those community associations that do have an express um, rental uh, provision should not be affected. It's conceivable and possible that community associations that don't have such a provision and are relying upon residential use and commercial use restrictions could potentially be affected. Um, just so you know the exact language that's in the proposed, this is the bill, again, this is not a law, it has not been adopted, but this is, this is the relative language or the relevant language from 206B. For the purpose of zoning, which is the, the portion that is, keeps it out of our contractual province, um, 
for purposes of zoning the following applied to rental of a dwelling. It's a residential use, not a commercial use of property, and not subject to special conditional use requirements different from other dwellings in the same zone. The big takeaways for us are A and B, which are residential use and not a commercial use. There are additional elements to 206B. There's sub three, sub four. Uh, those tend to deal with regulations that are permissible. Um, the big ones for us would be this if it were ever applicable. So those are the short-term rental bills, HB 4722. Um, the municipal, Michigan Municipal League had introduced its own bill um, in an effort to try to counter this one. And there are other bills that deal with the taxation of short-term rentals, but this is the most direct and appears to have the most support. So it is possible that something like this may be adopted down the line. Uh, the next thing that I wanted to talk about is something called the Michigan Housing Coalition. Uh, the Missing Michigan Housing Coalition is an initiative that um, came about in uh, March and April. The bills were introduced in April of uh, last year. And although there are different components to it, the basic underlying concept and purpose of the Michigan Housing Coalition is to try to promote and improve um, attainable housing in Michigan. In essence, to try to increase the housing supply and affordable housing in, in the state of Michigan. And the different tools that are, uh, that are being used currently to try to achieve that are those bills that are on, the, on your screen. In large part, each of these bills have passed the Senate. Um, none have been adopted into law. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, at least none of these have passed the House. And um, if they've been introduced in the House are still, are still sitting there. Um, but basically you can see a trend. Uh, SB 362 46, and HB 4647 um, the, and, and the other bills tend to use the benefit of housing tax credits. So they're trying to use tax credits to encourage the uh, redevelopment or renovation of existing buildings to provide for the creation of um, either uh, a multitude of housing through renovation or low income housing in, in a certain designated uh, distressed communities under the NEZ or uh, housing districts, certain housing districts under the Attainable Housing Rehabilitation Act. Um, so we'll see how this pans out. There is a commitment by a lot of legislators to try to further this. Um, this has been a big push. The reason it's in here is that uh, if this does carry forward and if, if these laws, uh, if these bills do come into law, then it is possible that we will see an increase in the number of um, community associations that are geared towards uh, affordable housing or low income housing in renovated buildings um, because they would be subsidized basically by uh, these bills if they pass. So this is something to keep an eye out for. It's a big initiative. It hasn't yet come to complete fruition, but um, is potentially coming down the pike. And uh, the last one that I wanted to introduce or at least discuss uh, about a bill that has been introduced is something called uh, the Prohibitive, Prohibited Restrictive Covenants Bill. Uh, this would be a new law. It would be a new act. Uh, basically what this does is um, in the state of Michigan and in almost every state, uh, there are restrictive covenants that are contained in existing deed restrictions that are today illegal. Either they're a violation of the Fair Housing Act um, they're, maybe they're discriminatory, um, or they're a violation of the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act, um, or they're a violation of federal law. But in essence, there are a number of restrictions that even today, uh, although un unenforceable in court, are, would st are still contained and have not been eliminated from restrictive covenants that have been recorded against communities in the state of Michigan. Um, a large number of these it, were recorded prior to World War II. Um, after World War II, they were not as prevalent, but they still exist. Um, what this law would do is it would render these to the extent they violate the Fair Housing Act or the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act, uh, they would be void. And, and in addition to being void, um, the board of directors would have the independent power to remove them by amendment from the documents, uh, even without having to obtain a member vote. Um, this bill serves a laudable purpose, the goal of which is to remove um, restrictive covenants that are illegal and otherwise unenforceable as being discriminatory. Um, as drafted though, there are a couple of things that are, uh, it, it's received some resistance. Some of the reasons it's received some resistance 
is because it may be difficult to figure out if it's a violation of the Fair Housing Act. It may not be able to be to determine whether it's a violation of the Fair Housing Act until after determination. So there is an open question right now as to whether the language being used goes a little too broadly. And there's also a concern that it could be used by co-owners to try to eliminate restrictions that aren't necessarily uh, illegal, but they object to on a personal level because of the way it's framed. Um, we do expect something like this to be enacted um, in the medium term. Uh, whether this bill uh, is able to receive enough support to pass um, is yet to be seen. It was introduced in March of 2021, and it came out of committee. It, it, it had its first hearing um, just uh, December 8th, so it took a while to get its first hearing. Um, it does have it does have a fair amount of support, and uh, it is a initiative of the Community Associations Institute in uh, in all the states to have a bill like this pass. Um, so while this has been introduced, it's pending. It's possible this may have enough support. If it doesn't have support in its in this form, uh, we do expect something like this to be adopted uh, down the line. So expect some expect, expect to see more on this, even if it's not in its uh, current form. So those three are the bills that have been introduced, meaning the uh, short-term rental bills, the bills related to the Michigan Housing Coalition, and then the Prohibition Unrestricted Covenants Bill. Um, there are three categories of bills, or three bills, and not bills yet because they have not yet been introduced, but there are three areas of legislation which appear to have, um, uh, there are, they are significant enough that we expect bills to be introduced um, before the end of the session, meaning before the end of 2022. Uh, and the first category deals with fines, liens, and assessments. Um, this is actually a uh, proposed legislation that the Community Associations Institute Legislative Action Committee for Michigan is trying to move forward with. And it arises out of an unpublished Court of Appeals decision called Channel View East uh, Condominium, Condominium versus Ferguson. Um, basically what went on in that case is there were fines that were imposed by the association and the Court of Appeals ruled that the fines were not considered assessments. And because the fines were not considered assessments and because you were only able to foreclose on assessments, the fines were able to be racked up, but they could not support a foreclosure action. Um, the risk there, the risk coming out of that case is that it's possible that a co-owner could utilize the Channel View East uh, decision and try to pay non-fine obligations if they opposed fines and avoid repercussion, meaning try and avoid uh, foreclosure by paying everything but fines um, on the basis and based on the argument that a fine is not an assessment. And um, so we've, uh, we're trying to get uh, legislation introduced that would accomplish two things. Um, first, in direct response to Channel View East, um, the proposed legislation would change MCL 59.206 and also uh, 59.208 to specify that any amounts that the um, a co-owner is liable for under the condominium documents would be considered an assessment. And the purpose for that would be to allow any amounts that the co-owner is liable for to support a con being considered an assessment and therefore being able to support a foreclosure action to prevent a circumstance where a co-owner would try to claim that they're not subject to foreclosure for a certain payment. In essence, to try to fill the gap that was created by Channel View East. Um, that's the first part of the proposed amendment. And uh, once a sponsor is identified, hopefully we'll see something like that within the next month or so. The second component though to this is, and you, anybody on the call who um, gets advice from us on this particular issue is probably used to this, but, um, in the Condominium Act, there is language that suggests or that states that you cannot impose a fine until there, there has been a notice and a hearing uh, before the Board of Directors as to whether a fine may be imposed. Um, and there is a certain approach that takes the position that you don't need to actually have the hearing. All you need to have is the opportunity for a hearing. And if the owner, if the co-owner does not choose to have a hearing, if they, if they do not affirmatively request to have a hearing, then the board does not have to have it. All the board needs to do is to present them with the opportunity for it that if they avail themselves of that chance or not is up to them. 
Um, the safest way under the current act is to have the hearing, even if not requested by the co-owner. And if the co-owner shows up or not, it's up to them. Um, but then once that hearing is held, you've complied with the act and you can move forward with the imposition of a fine. So if uh, what the proposed uh, change would be is the proposed change would clarify that it would be only the opportunity for a hearing that would be needed. Um, and that would in, be in line with the way some communities have approached the imposition of a fine. Uh, there are a number of communities that don't hold the hearing unless it's requested, and this would minimize risk for those communities and allow them to use that opportunity for hearing language and um, minimize the risk that they'll have a fine uh, that's determined to be invalid because they never held a hearing. So we should see more on that over the next month um, as the sponsor is identified. But those concepts are bring a fine into the definition of an assessment and allow it to support a lien and allow that lien to be foreclosed. And then also to clarify uh, whether a hearing is required um, for a fine to be imposed. The second one is, is at least to me, probably uh, the most significant thing that we, we would be talking to tonight probably after um, the Channel View, not Channel View East, but the, um, the Champlain Tower uh, collapse issue. Um, and that's because of its potential impact on so many community associations in Michigan. In, in 2018, the Marketable Record Title Act was amended by Public Act 2018-572. What that act did is it presents a risk to all community associations in, in Michigan that have deed restrictions or covenants that are older than 40 years, that if the uh, deed restrictions themselves are not identified by a library page number within the chain of title of a particular owner, that after a period of 40 years, those deed restrictions uh, may be automatically extinguished by the Market Record Title Act. Um, the out to that, meaning the way to avoid that from happening under the current act, is to file what's called a claim of interest in the register of deeds. Um, and that would preserve the restrictions, whether it be arguably, whether it be a, a condominium master deed, which is a, um, has a stronger argument, or whether it is a uh, subdivision restrictions that you may find for a homeowner association. Um, under the current version of the Marketable Record Title Act, there is a risk that any community older than 40 years uh, should record a claim of interest in order to make sure that their restrictions are not eliminated. Because of the potential negative effect on community associations uh, throughout Michigan, uh, this 2018 amendment, which was supposed to go into effect in March of 2021, was extended to uh, March of 2024. Um, so there is some time. Uh, March of 2024, in theory, is still a little over two years away, but it's not a lot of time. And the reason it's not a lot of time is there's presently not a consensus as to whether there's going to be a fix um, made to the amendment, the market record title, it was the 2018 amendment, to correct the deficiency. The deficiency being there are very few people other than those in the title insurance industry that really want to expose all community associations to the risk of having their deed restrictions extinguished. And so as a result, on the State Bar of Michigan Real Property Law section, has been working on an amendment to address this risk, to address the risk that the 2018 amendment may, whether it's inadvertent or advertent on purpose, uh, will extinguish deed restrictions throughout the state. So the proposed amendment that they're working on um, would exclude condominiums and it would exclude uh, subdivision restrictions that provide for the creation of mandatory associations from the 2018 amendments. So basically what it would mean is that condominiums and mandatory associations would not need to uh, file or record a claim of interest because they would not be affected by this amendment. However, the, there is a, still a gap. And the gap that exists is that even as the current model language um, is out there that exists, uh, voluntary associations, meaning associations that um, aren't provided for and for which membership is not mandatory under the governing documents, voluntary associations and community associations that are older than 1950 would still be exposed and not be excluded from operation of the Marketable Record Title Act. 
What that means is that voluntary associations, for example, a maintenance association, a lake maintenance association, and a community that has deed restrictions older than 1950, those entities, those corporations, and those communities still need to file a claim of interest in the register of deeds prior to March of 2024 in order to avoid having their deed restrictions or their restrictions eliminated. So that is a pretty big deal. It's something that um, we've been talking about since this bill, um, since the act was amended at the end of 2018. Um, but the amendment, the RPLS amendment, which is a, should be a big benefit, um, still has a couple of holes, but look for that in the not too distant future. We actually expected that to be introduced already. It was a little bit surprising that it hadn't been introduced yet, um, but it should be introduced in the next month or so. Um, and the last category of I, concepts that I wanted to talk about also arises, still arises out of the Champlain South power collapse. Um, and this is somewhat connected to the um, lender requirements from the federal side that I talked about at the very beginning. Um, but the significance of this issue is that the lender requirements are just the beginning. Coming out of uh, the Surfside or the Champlain Tower collapse is the realization and the recognition that there are buildings all throughout this country, there are buildings all throughout the state of Michigan that are of differing degree of maintenance. Some um, and are of differing degree of financing, meaning that um, some associations in buildings are going to have adequate financing available in order to make repairs. And some communities and some buildings are not going to have that available. Uh, that was a major issue uh, within the, um, the Surfside condo collapse because uh, at least the board's position was that they could not get a consensus amongst the communities as to whether to be able to impose a special assessment that they believed necessary for making certain repairs. Um, the significance of that is we do expect that legislatures throughout the country are going to be evaluating what their laws are regarding the um, buildings that exist, the maintenance of the buildings. Um, and we expect a nationwide evaluation of a building a sort, of, sort of really I say certificate, certificate process, but really a building certification process. The different elements, requirements to obtain reserve studies, meaning imposing requirements to obtain reserve studies and obligations for a reserve funding. Is reserve funding adequate? Um, the Community Associations Institute is actually coming out with, uh, still working on um, proposed leg model legislation. Once that model legislation comes out, we expect that to provide a framework for um, a, st a statutory framework of bills that can be introduced. They had formed a task force shortly after the event to investigate the issue. That task force came out with their uh, first analysis in October of 2021. And then we expect to have um, the model language for the uh, model statutes to come out in the not too distant future. Um, what I expect it to happen is I expect a greater emphasis on requiring buildings to be inspected and certified and in, in condensing the timing on certifications that need to take place. Uh, for example, in Surfside, it was a 40 year certification process. So every 40 years, the building had to be uh, certified. That time frame is probably going to be narrowed to um, 12 to 20 or something less. In addition to uh, building inspections and certification, um, I expect that there will be a periodic reserve studies may be required. Um, this is not presently required in Michigan. Um, as you may recall from the discussion on Fannie Mae, uh, Fannie Mae doesn't require it, although they call it a, a best practice. But I do expect that reserve studies will come out and we'll see model language that uh, proposes the reserve studies to be required. So if your condominium or your association or co-op, or depending upon what type of buildings you have, if you have not performed a reserve study or you're not in tune to what a reserve study is, uh, you probably should start taking a look into it to see what it, what it contemplates and, and what it involves. Um, they are very useful in identifying what capital improvements are necessary and anticipating the costs in the future uh, for uh, capital improvements. In addition to reserve study requirements, um, I also expect to see additional requirements regarding reserve funding. In Michigan, we already have a 10% of budget requirement, so it's possible we may not see something um, different. 
but uh, it's something that's going to be looked at. So it's an area that I, I do expect to be tweaked, although I don't necessarily know the direction it's gonna go. At some level, it's gonna involve the developer. At some level, it may involve a higher number than 10%. But I do expect reserve funding to be analyzed, especially for uh, tower type buildings or um, buildings of multiple floors. Um, another, the last element, the last area is that um, one of the issues with the Surfside condo collapse was, uh, you know, there's a, an element of the board of directors, a discretionary decision making on the board of directors and the people within the community to avoid making, whether it's reserve funding, whether it's special assessments, but to avoid funding and avoid uh, repair obligations. And so depending, I expect that area to be looked at and it's possible that we may see a tightening of the um, discretion that exists for the board and the community in deciding whether repairs are necessary. In Michigan, we tend to have in practice an additional um, assessment versus a special assessment concept where if it's repair and replacement, the board has the discretion to do it. If, it's a, if it goes beyond repair and replacement, then it may need to go to a co-owner vote. If it um, goes beyond a certain monetary threshold, um, but it's still something that I expect to see analyzed um, and we'll see what, the, what model language comes out down the line. So those are the um, topics. Uh, we've got the uh, federal law, or the, excuse me, the federal regulations that have come out dealing with um, Regulation F in fair debt. We've got the lender requirements for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac regarding um, warrantable and non-warrantable condominiums and conventional financing. We have the three bills that were introduced, short or the three areas uh, that were, have introduced bills, short-term rentals, Michigan Housing Coalition, and then the uh, prohibited restrictive covenants. Then we have the three areas coming down the way, uh, marketable record title, the um, Mark the record title, the uh, issues arising out of the Surfside condo collapse, and then the uh, fines, liens, and assessments language. So that's what we have for the legislative update. If you are muted and would like to ask questions, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and, and fire away. I will do my best to answer and, and try not to avoid any questions, although I might still do that. So Don, you've hey, unmuted yourself. Hey, Go ahead. Yeah, bye, bye. yeah my question was, <laughs> Was regarding fines. Um, can can the board, without co-owner approval, um, issue fines to a homeowner for late payments on dues? Uh, I would probably not be doing that, and the main reason is that um, you already have the if you have a late payment for an assessment, then you already have that built in. You know, the, op, the underlying obligation of the owner is to pay the assessment and then they'll have a late charge. I would not expect to see a separate fine on top of a late fee uh, connected to on payment. Okay, thank you. Um, Pebble Creek. I, um, um, I, uh, hi, Matthew. Um, this is uh, Karen Lloyd at Pebble Creek. I have a few questions regarding... Okay. Regarding the late fee or the fees on um, a homeowner's account and not being able to use that fee as a reason to lien the property or foreclose. Right. Um, in that... <laughs> In that regard, excuse me, if the condo documents state that a homeowner must be in good standing, can Thank that you. late fee be declared not in good standing or is that not a part of that, that definition? Am so, I making myself clear? I'm sorry. Yep, you are. There's actually a couple things going on with your question and I'll kind of address the, the two that I heard. Um, so first, the question of good standing. Um, my expectation, and, and again, this is, this is completely dependent upon the actual language in your documents. But if the question is whether somebody is standing or not, my expectation is that if they have failed to abide by nearly any requirement under the documents, that would mean they are not in good standing. 
whether it's failure to pay a fine, whether it's failure to pay a late fee that was properly imposed, whether it's failure to pay an assessment, whether it's a, a failure to bring in the trash cans, even though they were supposed to when they left them out for a week, all of those instances I would expect to constitute in essence, a default under the documents, which would put them into a lack of good standing. Now, the consequence of, good, of not being in good standing is also going to be dependent on your documents. In some communities, if you are not in good standing, you cannot vote. Um, in other communities, whether you are in good standing or not has no bearing on whether you can vote or not. And so you would need to take a look at your documents. Um, the other question, and where I, I kind of thought you were headed with it, deals with the ability to use um, non-payment of a fine or non-payment of a late fee as a, a basis to uh, foreclose. And, and really what that involves is, are those amounts properly included in a definition of a lien? And the trouble in the general case was that the documents in that case did not include in the definition of an assessment fines. If a fine was included in the definition of an assessment, or if the document specifically said that a fine could be included in a lien and that a fine could be subject to foreclosure, then Channel View East case would not have applied and you, they could have, you know, they could have foreclosed. Um, the fix that's going on is to try to clarify that even for con community condominiums that don't have that language, a fine should be considered an assessment. Um, but it, that, at least at the moment, that aspect is dependent upon the language in your documents. Thank you. Yep. Um, Curtis, you unmuted yourself too. So I'm assuming you've got a question. I just have a comment on the reserve study. Yes. Uh, he, here at the Cloisters, uh, um, we're having a reserve, a reserve study done by uh, reserve advisors of uh, Milwaukee. Okay. And, and um, they uh, did a reserve study uh, of our property in 1995. So this is the second time we've you we've used them. And um, we're, we're paying $5,000 for this reserve study. And that, that's a good example. I, I think that does a good, thank you, Curtis, because I think that in context gives people on the call an idea of timing and, 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 and cost. Um, and also there are different levels of reserve studies, you know, different, like, you know, you can get a very stringent reserve study, which is everything, anything and everything. And then you know you can get a, a looser reserve study. I think there's four or five different categories. Um, if you're interested in, in seeing the types of reserve studies that are out there, um, the Community Association Institute has adopted our reserve study standards. So if you took a look, if you use the incredible resource of Google and typed in Community Association Institute reserve study standards, uh, you'd be able to see um, what's out there. And um, the main reason I mention it is Right now, policymakers are struggling with what to do with aging infrastructure at all levels, you know, roads, bridges, and buildings. And buildings have a direct impact on us because buildings throughout this country are used for residential housing and are in varying conditions of repair or disrepair. And policymakers are trying to figure out how to balance the desire to allow people to make their own decisions with the need to make sure that we stay safe as a community. And largely coming out of the Surfside condo collapse, I do expect to see the pendulum swing a little bit or maybe a lot of it towards a desire to try to keep people safe and increase the types of regulations that deal with the requirements for making buildings safe at varying levels, whether it's inspections and certifications, reserve studies, reserve funding, or uh, mandatory repairs. Um, let's see, can I get my hand up again? Let's see. Yes, yep. <laughs> you, you are, uh, you're exceeding your questions, but we'll allow it. Well, this one's good for us all. If okay. We, if we 
fail as board members to exercise our fiduciary responsibility regarding um, building repairs, um, uh, proper reserve funding, capital yep. funding, can, all of that. Are there any uh, Michigan cases to that effect that um, hold the associations responsible? Uh, well, there are actually two elements of responsibility. One is when is the association responsible? And the other is when is a director exposed to personal liability for a breach of fiduciary duty? So um, the, the question of when is the association responsible? And by that, I mean the entire community. You know, when the association has to dip into association funds and to pay out, that's gonna be driven by, by basically two concepts. One, do the governing documents impose the obligation on the association to take care of the thing, you know, whether it's maintenance, whether it's repair, whether it's replacement, whether it's insurance, you know, do the governing documents say that the association as administered by the board of directors, are they required to take care of it? And that's association liability or responsibility, excuse me, is a better term. You then have the concept of association liability, which is where something goes wrong and it creates a liability to a third party, uh, maybe to a co-owner, maybe to a neighbor. Um, you, you know, you have a roof leak that causes damage to somebody's unit. Is the association liable um, to the damage to the unit? You have a tree limb fall and it damages somebody's car and that tree limb is on a tree that's on the general common elements. Um, is the association liable for the damage to the car? You have somebody twist an ankle on a path, on a common element path. You know, those are questions of liability. And it's possible that the association under tort law would be liable for those circumstances. It's, it's the next question, and, and that's going to be determined by, in general, whether the association as a, as a property manager um, did what it was expected to do to take care of the land and to take care of the thing that it's supposed to take care of. The next question, which is what I think you're really getting at is, when am I as a director exposed to liability for this type of decision-making? And, and that's gonna happen and play out kind of in the following scenario, or at least using the following principles. Um, if your documents have been updated to include limitations of liability available to a director, then the directors are likely have minimal exposure, or at least as minimal as possible under the Nonprofit Corporation Act for a breach of fiduciary duty, um, except in instances of wrongdoing on their part. And by that, I mean an intentional wrongful act, a criminal act, uh, potentially gross negligence um, or reckless misconduct. Um, if you engage in conduct that is grossly negligent, reckless or intentionally wrong, then you as a director, um, even in the presence of limitations of liability uh, are, are, are likely to, or there's a high likelihood you'll be exposed to the potential for liability in those circumstances. But, but that's not how most directors engage. There is a principle in Michigan law that provides monetary protection to a director in certain circumstances. If a director, if directors, conduct business in reliance upon the expert advice of experts qualified in the field. And I say experts qualified in the field, that's not the exact terminology, but that's basically the meaning. If you go to a, a qualified professional in the area, that qualified professional gives you advice to do something, you do it and it still goes wrong. The association may be liable, but you as a director should be insulated from liability as long as you relied in good faith on the, that expert's advice. And, and that is an example of why a reserve study is so significant because a reserve study can potentially be a means for the board of directors to say, I'm not a professional in knowing when foundations need to be repaired, when the pool needs to be redone or, or when things need to be fixed. So I go out and I hire somebody who is an expert to give me advice as to when it needs to be repaired. And, and so one of the benefits to a reserve study, just be an example, or, or, or a lawyer or, or an engineer on engineering issues or an electrical uh, professional on electrical issues, is that you as a director 
if somebody says that you as a director did something wrong and are personally liable, it gives you somewhat of a shield to say, hey, I did the best that I could do. I am not a professional. I'm a volunteer. I, in good faith, relied upon this third-party professional, and I performed what they told me to do. And in that instance, you can minimize the exposure of the individual board members. So hopefully that answers it. I know it was a little longer than expected, but you've got two levels. You've got association liability driven by responsibility under the documents and liability um, for their own conduct. And then you have the individual exposure and the individual liability of a director for the decisions and the conduct that they engage in as a director and the different limitations that are available uh, depending upon the documents and then the way they conduct their business. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, all right. If we so, don't get another question, it just begged another one. I'm sorry, <laughs> but I'm gonna wait. <laughs> you have got, uh, that, that is fine. Um, you know, you, I'll you wait. Know, you probably, you, you can probably, inst you know, institute a five second pause. So <laughs> take a breath, five seconds. If nobody jumps in, have at it and I'll answer what I can. Is this podcast recorded so that we could get a copy of it after? Uh, it, it is recorded. If you are a premium service member, then you would have the ability to access the recording. Thank you. All right, um, I, I think you're golden. If you've got another question, <laughs> fire away. Okay. It's, it's another question related to the last one. So if a board hires a property manager yep. and the property manager is not an expert, if you will, or has limited skills, how does that, and the property manager guides the board how does yep. that impact the board? Well, in many instances, the property manager is going to say, hey, like, we're going to need to engage the services of so-and-so. Uh, whether it's an attorney to figure out what the responsibilities or obligations are under a document, or whether you need to engage a structural engineer to determine whether a repair is needed or not. You know, that property manager is going to be able to help you a couple ways. You know, one, they may have contacts. They may know. They may be able to point you in the right direction very efficiently. You know, they may know individuals or companies right off the bat that they can point you in the right direction towards. Um, they they may also identify a problem that you don't know exists. Um, you know, they 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 will help administer, meaning they'll help they'll help collect assessments, they'll help you with enforcement, they'll help you with with maintenance, with hiring contractors. And, and they can help point you in the right direction to finding needed professionals. Um, but in, in many instances, I would be, I'd be surprised if a property manager was, was willing to put themselves in a position of holding themselves out in, as an expert in the field if they weren't that expert. In many instances, they'll make a recommendation when that recommendation is needed. Thank you. Uh, Matt, you, uh, yes. uh, Matt, may I ahead, uh, uh, may I ask a question uh, about our 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 documents at the cloisters here, which you have been involved in? I can, if I uh, yes, if I can answer them and recall them, I I can. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, as as you know, we are uh, our. Doc, our, doc, our documents, the uh, master deed and the articles of incorporation uh, were written in 1978 and we're, and we're re rewriting them. Uh, and uh, both the master deed and the Articles of Incorporation had bylaws attached to them. But under the new documents, there will only be one, by, uh, one set of, by, of bylaws 
which will be attached to the master deed. Now, under, uh, under the old Articles of Incorporation, the bylaws dealt with the board, the membership of the board and our annual meeting. But that, uh, uh, the old Articles of Incorporation and the bylaws attached to that were replaced by a new Articles of Incorporation. So, so we lost the bylaws that dealt with um, the, the board and our annual meeting. Uh, uh, and those topics uh, were to be covered in the new by, bylaws, which are attached to the new mas master deed, but the new master deed was was defeated. So uh, really, we don't have a governing document pertaining to our board right now that's been approved Cur by Curtis, the co- Can I, so I, can I step yeah. in for two seconds? Um, I think, so I remember my record, the association bylaws that you have, the passage of the Articles of Incorporation uh, did not eliminate the association bylaws. So your association bylaws are still there. Um, they were not recorded. So association bylaws, um, you know, in many instances are different than the condominium bylaws, which is what you're in tune to. Um, you are still under your old documents uh, for your master deed, condo bylaws, and association bylaws, but not under the Articles of Incorporation. Um, and if you'd like, we could set up a time to, to go over it, but I, I'm pretty sure you're okay because the passage of the Articles of Incorporation did not eliminate the association bylaws. Okay, okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you. So hopefully that helps. Yeah. Um, but it is like one of the points you're making, which is it is one of the um, concepts that exists is the association bylaws are an outgrowth of, the, of a corporate model that viewed the bylaws as being the document that governs the, how the company deals with itself. You know, whether it's meetings, it's directors, it's appointment of officers, it's powers and directors. And for years, that concept of association bylaws was kept different from the condominium bylaws. But then the trouble was, is that the condominium bylaws as required by the Condominium Act often touched on the same things. And so you often had inconsistencies between the two or because they were not required to be reported, the association bylaws got lost in the shuffle and misplaced when the box of documents moved from one secretary to the next. And so the, what most communities do today is they take the association bylaws and the condominium bylaws and they combine them so it's all in one document. So you can see in a singular document what the obligations of the board is, what happens at annual meetings, when you can call a special meeting, um, and then the number of directors and so on and so on. So the modern trend is for sure to combine those two, um, but the, uh, the passage of, that, that's true. The, the modern trend is to combine those two into one. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yep. Pebble Creek, you're muted. That can't mean that you don't have any more questions. Well, we can always think of questions at Pebble <laughs> Creek. <laughs> um, actually, we are in the process of doing our third reserve study. Okay. And Regarding the usefulness of a reserve study, have you seen um, any correlation between the reserve studies and loans for associations? Um, 
Yes, uh, in some instances, a lender may want to know whether or not a reserve study has been done and when the last one was done. Um, I have seen it as the beginning of a requirement that is sometimes waived, um, but the answer is yes. If you have a recent reserve study, you are likely to be asked about it by the loan officer when they discuss it with you, assuming that they are experienced in community association lending. Our last one was 16 years ago. Is that recent? <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's probably not. No. Um, I mean, it's going to be helpful um, because it will identify those things you should be aware of. Mm -hmm. um, but the time frames that I'm seeing is five to seven years. Okay. And um, that's the, and, and these, like, I'm not suggesting those as standards, but those are the time frames that um, I'm seeing some communities as wanting to impose upon themselves. Thank you. Yep. And you can, you can, one thing to keep in mind is that's gonna vary depending upon your community. You know, if you're a site condominium and you have a clubhouse and a pool, you know, your need to do a reserve study is just going to be different than if you're a 20 story building with, um, you know, adjacent uh, uh, walkways to the next building uh, below ground parking garage and um, top floor pool, you know, and, and I, I picked the most extreme examples I could, but you can see between those two in that spectrum, there's going to be a varying uh, benefit of reserve study. Thank you. Yep. All right, um, anything else? Thank you very much. Uh, no problem. Uh, thank you very much for attending. Uh, I, I love to hear myself talk, but it's much better when there is an audience that is um, listening and, and hopefully informed. So just wanted to say thank you for attending. Um, and. You know, hopefully you attend these in the future. And if you have questions, feel free to call us or send me an email. And, um, you know, it was nice seeing all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Thank good you. night. Thank you as well.